Coming up on this week's Currently Trending, Milan Design Week, Middle Eastern Design, and the importance of craftsmanship. Welcome to Harper's Bazaar Arabia's Currently Trending podcast. I am Rebecca Ann Proctor and the Editor-in-Chief of Harper's Bazaar Interiors. This week we are discussing current trends in the world of architecture and interior design. I am joined by Dubai-based, Croatian-born architect and designer, Victor Eugenia, responsible for some of the region's most groundbreaking projects. He recently collaborated with fashion designer Rami Al-Ali on The Eye, a design installation displayed in design, Dubai Design District in October-November 2017. Victor also designed the trophies for the Harper's Bazaar Interiors Award in 2015 and was a judge for the Harper's Bazaar Interiors Awards in 2016. Also present with us today is Ravi Samani, the Creative Solutions Director of Harper's Bazaar Arabia. Ravi has managed the interior design of several Harper's Bazaar Arabia projects, including the House of Bazaar in 2017, as well as a recent collaboration with the Dubai Mall's new Fashion Avenue. We often talk about trends in the world of fashion and also in art. Given that this series is called Currently Trending, how would you define the current trends in architecture and design? Victor, given your recent trip to Milan for Milan Design Week, what were some of the highlights that you saw when you were there? We're returning back to the era of, of luxury living and modernism where, you know, form followed function, everything was timeless, everything was luxurious. There was a lot of attention to craftsmanship and design and functionality. And I think... Uh, seeing in Milan what was presented at various stands at the fair and uh, what was happening during the uh, Saloni in the city. I think a lot of that was going back to that era, be it the uh, the exhibition stand of Knoll that's always designed by OMA, uh, which always looks kind of modernistic and goes back to the era of their designers, uh, Mies van der Rohe and everyone else and Marcel Breuer or the Villa Necchi I visited in Milan, that was one of the prime examples of that era where um, really everything was beautifully crafted, um, which we'll discuss, I guess, in a bit about that, you know, using natural materials, uh, making sure products are timeless. I think a lot of that's gone away from those hippie pop um, designs that kind of follow fashion and don't really live up or stay with us for, for a longer period. Mm. And in terms of, you know, there's the Fuori Salone aspect, which is which are all of the design objects outside of the city. And then there's obviously the fair, you know, Salone del Mobile. In terms of Fuori Salone, what were some of the highlights that you remember most? What are the what are the top projects that really stood out visually for you? Um, well, it was hard to catch everything, even though I was there for a week. Um, I think Last Wit was definitely one of the highlights because they've managed to secure a location that hasn't been touched for the last 30 years. The, um, I believe, Teatro Gerolamo. Yeah, beautiful, te- uh, beautiful it was theater. A great, great exhibition in a, in, a, in a tiny, really spectacular theater. And I think the whole theme of Last Fit that they've put together with the monsters and the cabaret show together with it and designers they've invited to work together with, uh, be it uh, Martin Bass or, um, well, Fabio Novembre. Um, it was kind of really nice to see and well-deserved award at the end of the fair as as the best uh, exhibition. Um, Another one was probably at the Super Studio Nendo, which again is a complete opposite away from, you know, the handwork and and, and craftsmanship, more more in a technological aspect. So they presented some incredible incredible work and um, possibly one other that I would know is uh, the visit to the Vicenza de Cotti's showroom. So he's one of the big designers represented by Carpenter's Workshop Gallery, and he's shown some spectacular pieces where uh, he's merged, you know, some of the super traditional craftsmanship from Murano, marble making, um, and kind of bonded it all together <clears throat> with fiberglass and creating these really spectacular, timeless uh, furniture pieces. So those were probably my highlights. Yeah, great. There was so much to see, so it was very exciting. And there's even Khalid Shafar, if I'm not mistaken, at the Correct. Teatro. Correct. Khalid had his first Girolamo. piece with uh, with Last Fit. It was uh, the Eggy, mm-hmm. uh, kind of a broken, uh, hard boiled or soft boiled egg. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> but again, uh, merging uh, you know traditional craftsmanship of of mouth blown glass. 
uh, with a with a contemporary concept and shape. Um, I think it was it was quite beautiful to see his work there, right next to um, the works by Patricia Orchiola or or other really uh, big international names. So it's great to see someone from the Emirates collaborating with a company uh, like Lasvet. Mm -hmm. And Ravi, in terms of trends, trends or themes or however you want to put it in terms of the world of architecture and interior design, through your various projects with Harper's, what what have you found that resonates most with uh, with our readers and with visitors to various projects? What um, what are some of the key moments or key designers that you that you happen to really like working with? So in terms of key brands and designers and design houses that we've worked with, um, for example, for House at House of Bazaar, we worked with the House of Hackney, um, Gallery Nationale, where um, our viewers and visitors of the house were able to assess, view, um, antique and collectible items in situ, as well as some contemporary pieces through our kitchen partner at the house as well, where people were able to experience not just brands and their product offering amongst a showroom, but they were able to assess how you can really live with a brand and how you can really live with these design pieces and items that you'll want to purchase for your interiors. And I think that's why concepts such as the House of Bazaar work really well. Even if you look at what we've done in the new fashion extension of Dubai more recently, um, you know, you can actually look at a curated space by Harper's Bazaar Interiors and it sells you a lifestyle. When people open up a magazine, um, they look at content that we have curated and we sell them an aspiration, we sell them a dream, we sell them a lifestyle. So I think that's what viewers will want to see um, versus just branded showrooms where you can only look at pieces in isolation versus experiencing an entire lifestyle. This idea of experiencing, I think, is really interesting because more and more it's not just about buying that one object or buying or, you know, being in, in the, the home, which is an mm. experience itself, but it's yeah. about creating an experience yeah. through a marriage of, you know, art, architecture and design. And it's about being able to go to an authoritative voice or a brand or a publication like Harper's Bazaar Arabia, where we're really able to see um, and we're able to give people access to trends, brands, and um, collectible items and pieces from around the world. You know, there are a lot of inaccessible pieces, inaccessible brands, and new and emerging designers that people don't often have access to, which is why they would come to us, which makes both our publication and the experiential initiatives that we provide relevant to people in the region. Yeah, well, publication like yours obviously are one of the most crucial aspects of bringing these designs to the region here. and making people familiar with these brands mm. and designers and the names and what's happening around the world. So yes, that is that is crucial. And contributing towards it as well, which I think is super important. Like in Milan, there was um, uh, the collaboration I know that Milan did with um, a series of local designers where they were able to show and showcase their product design and architecture and those various elements featured in Milan, like you, like uh, Rebecca, you just mentioned, uh, with Khalid and with Al Joud as well. So I think it's important. Yeah, definitely. And that's, there is, there's something about Dubai, you know, we're all from, we're not from this region, mm -hmm. any of us at this table, but we're all contributing to the local scene. And I think it's this, this marriage now more than ever between the international and the local. And obviously you want to you want to create homegrown brands uh, more than ever, but it obviously is important to have a dialogue with the international brands. So, mm -hmm. you know, making sure that you get to Milan Design Week or, you you know, Beirut Design Week or, you know, even now this Amman and, and bringing it back to, to Dubai is, is crucial. Or, you know, Victor, you're a designer yourself, an architect. Um, how are you kind of synthesizing the international and the local together with Sorry, your Sorry, I'll just go back to the, to the exhibition of... Um that uh, Design District has brought back to uh, Milan and showcasing some of the talent from the Emirates. I mean, I thought that was really crucial. Um, not only, obviously, from the aspect of brands or anything, it's, it was literally bridging cultures. So it was it was under the patronage of, of the Ministry of Culture as well. So it was more about not only, you know, regional designers and design, and the exhibition was beautifully curated by Khalid Shafar, but it was also bringing new and unexpected materials that we don't really see in the design world elsewhere. So, you know, use of camel leather and fur mm. and uh, 
um, dried palm tree leaves and uh, all these uh, unusual materials that I'm sure many people don't even know or haven't experienced, especially not in connection with uh, furniture design or, or design. So I thought that was really, really important to 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 start that conversation from from that cultural regional point of view rather than straight away jumping into um, into that pool of uh, international design. And I think it's really important, like Rebecca, what you said earlier was about maintaining that dialogue between the regional and the international. And I think internationally, it's also about helping the international community take the region seriously as a design hub. Mm. And it's about people recognizing that talent is emerging from this region as well as other global cities as well. You know, if we look at the emergence of, of nations over the past like two decades, such as Portugal, who now play a very prominent role in the design and interior scene and architectural scene worldwide. It's about giving this region a platform, and which is why it's so important, like you mentioned, to to, to enhance and for the um, local cultural and, and the government for of the Middle East or of the UAE to kind of enhance the mid uh, to enhance the UAE as a um, design hub. I think there's so many areas of opportunity and growth. Uh, you know, when we're looking at any maturing market, if you look at what's been going on in the region over the past 50, 60 years, like it's incredible. The way the design scene has, involved, has evolved, the way the um, architectural scene has evolved, um, Victor, obviously you've been a prominent part of. I think that in terms of it's identifying growth opportunities and also identifying areas of um, potential growth and then harnessing that through educational institutes, for example, and for the local and the international community, once again, to take design and product design, interior design seriously from the region. I think that's where the main areas of growth lie. What yeah, do you I, think? I, I would agree in, in you know the last few years when I've been editing the magazine, and also for Harper's Bazaar Art, hmm. everyone talks about educational initiatives. And I do think that that's something that that is you know growing and it's fostering hmm. a new generation of designers that are even just just telling people about design, about art, and getting them excited about it. I think that's that's part of the, you know, part of the process. And then mm. having having these these designers participate in Milan Design Week through sister exhibitions, and then you know collaborating with you know, Khaled Shafar was displayed next to the Capano brothers. You know, at Last Fit. I mean, that's fantastic. That's a real beautiful visual mm. and cultural dialogue through modern and contemporary design. And that's that's key today, I think. I think also if we're looking at education and if we're looking at instilling design values um, through to younger generations, I think it needs to start off as young as nursery. You know, really, really inspire people and inspire children to take design seriously and really allow them to, to experiment with design and with color and materials and with fabric. And I think there's a lot that we could be doing. And I think that's why places such as D3 and the, some of the initiatives that they have over there are so powerful and relevant, not just for what's going on right now, but for future generations as well. Yes, but it needs to go to a much broader community than just us who work in the industry. We're already so in the order, industry, yeah. In order for, for, for that whole... Um, I, I won't, won't use the word movement for for all that to happen and and get a real big impact nationwide. Mm. It really needs to go further than just uh, than just us who work in the industry. So I think that's where you know magazines like you, uh, Design District, uh, various uh, fairs and exhibitions, and exposure to that really play play a crucial part. So now we see, you know, up until recently, <clears throat> a lot of commercial projects, architecture and interiors were really focused on the experience only, not necessarily on particular design pieces uh, or, or architects in that space. But now, for example, with the extension of Dubai Mall, we see, um, you know, much larger investments in the art. So, you know, seeing artists like uh, Tony Craig installed in, in, in the Fashion Avenue or in front of the IFC, I think it's it's crucial that, that you know, people see art and design uh, on an everyday basis and, and just get familiar with being in touch with it mm. rather than just uh, the chosen few who, who, who live in that world. It is very much about the impact through art, through design, through interiors and how you change the collective consciousness of a society, especially in 
a place like Dubai, where it's such a melting pot of so many different cultures and people from so many different backgrounds and with people who have so many different ideals, you know, aesthetic, good design um, is a translatable uh, discipline, I guess, across which transcends cultural and, and linguistic barriers. Yeah. And we are at, at kind of a, a turning point, so to say, I think, in, in the world of tech and web design. And, and then obviously on the opposite spectrum, you have this sort of return to craft and they seem they are opposed in many ways, but you do see them more and more working together in unison. How would you both see this, see the influence of technology on design? And then on the other hand, there's a lot of designers who are, who are really returning to craft and they're trying very hard to continue this work with local artisans to ensure a continuation of a tradition well, and a rapidly changing landscape. <laughs> that's definitely true. And you could see that in Milan. I mean, on one side, you'd have really people working with traditional materials like marble, like blown glass. Uh, uh, you'd see the tours of the, of the beautiful villas and everyone returning to it. There was a beautiful exhibition called Unsighted. Uh, by Carwan Gallery, also in Milan. And uh, one of the artists uh, has done extensive research on extinct marbles, marbles that have disappeared from the world and tried to recreate them uh, in these traditional techniques of, of, of painting and, and uh, melting materials together to achieve that look of a marble that's not available anymore. And then on the other side, you have designers like Nando, or uh, a Locatelli who's 3D printed an entire house. So there really are these two completely opposing um, directions. Um, no one says they can't work together, obviously. Uh, we're here in the 21st century. We obviously have to take uh, our current lifestyle into, into consideration and then kind of translate all of that together and create uh, spaces that are suitable for, for today's life. So be it that that technology is visible or less visible, um, the um, focus and emphasis on sustainability and our environmental friendliness uh, of our projects and products, uh, and then also really fostering and, and protecting that know-how of, of the traditional craft craftsmanship. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you have a brand that I saw in, during Milan Designer, Timothy Olton, who's British, and he has a facility fantastic uh, design. He, this is first time at Milan Design Week and he has a facility in, in China where he's you know really working with these artisan craftsmen um, who've been doing this, this special dye technique for centuries and bringing it back into his quite contemporary design that has a more holistic feel to it. And, and it's, uh, it's fascinating. It's fascinating to see how there's a marriage between the two. And people really love that. It gives integrity and substance to Two piece of design. I think the more this happens, or Ewan McTabi, who uh, there was a trip to Nepal that one of my contributors uh, went to. I went to. as well. Uh, yeah. And you went too? Yeah. I, th I thought you did, Victor, <laughs> uh, in September, and where they visited, you know, the designers or the craftsmen that were creating the spectacular. Yeah. And that really gives, I think it, it, it really injects a soul into the design piece. And obviously, there is the technological aspect, and because we have to. Um, use innovate. technology. Yeah, we have to innovate. We have no. to stay present, but we also can't. Like, it's really important not to forget the past and not to forget our heritage. And that's that's always a little bit of a risk when we're innovating so much. But I find, especially at Milan Design Week, as you were saying, Victor, and from you know your points of view as well, Ravi, that there is the synthesis. People are trying to marry the two, and it's it's the happy marriage that. And brands evolve, just like people evolve, and how technology evolves. I think brands also have to remain ahead of the curve, but obviously still retain um, true to their DNA and to the core of what their brand stands for. And I think technology can assist you in doing that. Yes, but more and more we see that all of these brands are really refocusing on, on luxury, on craftsmanship. And that's why also we see the prices of luxury goods going up. I mean, mm. every year these brands are investing more and more into adding more additional working hours by hand mm -hmm. just to achieve that extra level of craftsmanship, That's exactly. craftsmanship yeah. uh, to it, be it a handbag, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, or, or a piece of furniture or, or architecture or surfaces. Um, everyone is trying to uh, lift themselves away from that mass, mass market uh, production and, um, and try to offer that beautifully crafted um, 
handmade piece. That's exactly what Timothy was saying. He said sometimes people talk about, wow, it's so expensive, but he said the money is in the materials. And it's true. You know, you're paying extra for that beautifully beautifully done sofa that's um, worked maybe, you know, it's taken a month or two to create in such a beautiful way. And that that is supporting the artisans, but it's also maintaining a heritage. And I think that brings us back to the idea of, of luxury today. And it's something that I thought we could end on. Um, what do you what do you both feel defines luxury living today? I think it's evolved. How do you see it has evolved in design? Um, I'll have to think about that. Luxury for me is scarcity. <laughs> luxury is scarcity. It's um, pure. I know I'm bringing it back to quite um, a disciplined economical way of looking at it, but it's all about supply and demand. And it's about making sure that you are producing a good and you are producing um, an item or a piece or whatever it is that you're looking for within the remit of your project or your home. And it's about retaining that scarcity. Should it be beautifully crafted? Of course, because I think a lot of people disregard um, items in the here and now, whereas I think a lot of people, especially with craftsmanship and the, and the price tags associated with these highly crafted items, they should be viewed more as an investment that will withstand the test of time and that you can pass on across generations of, of your family as well. Yeah, I definitely think um, individuality is one of the key <clears throat> key words here in, in today's world, especially in, in, in our projects. Um, let's say the private homes that we create for our clients or even the, um, the, the more commercial projects, really the focus on individuality, on customization, on bespoke production, um, something that's made for them <clears throat> or, or be it the investment pieces of collectible design or, or art. So really something that will create uh, an environment that um, speaks to them, that uh, gives their image out to the world as well. Um, whilst obviously always maintaining that level of comfort and um, um, functionality. Functionality is the word. Great. Thank you very much for joining us on our currently trending weekly podcast. And thanks especially to Ravi and Victor for being with us here today. Thanks for having us. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. To get the latest on Harper's Bazaar interiors, visit harpersbazaarabia.com slash interiors. Follow us on social media or use the hashtag HBA currently trending.